Good morning. My name is Emanuele Di Lorenzo from the Georgia Institute of Technology. And today I would like to report on some of the contributions of Pisces Working Group 27, uh, Pacific Climate Variability and Change, on the advances and challenges of forecasting North Pacific climate and ecosystem change. And this is work that receives contribution from Mercedes Pozzo Buil, Nate Mantua, Matt Newman, and I also would like to acknowledge the co-chairs of Working Group 27, Shoshiro Minobi and Mike Foreman. The main question that we are going to address today is which advances in Pacific climate enable ecosystem forecasting? Before going through the talk, I would like to notice two things. Uh, the first is throughout the talk, I will acknowledge contributions of Working Group 27 with a small uh, blue symbol, which is just a small version of the logo. And I will also attempt to minimize the use of climate acronyms and perhaps use plain English. Having said that, I will use the acronym El Nino and this is a map of this uh, El Nino Southern Oscillation. And in particular, this map is showing the sea surface temperature anomaly during the peak phase of the El Nino in the winter. Now, it has been known for a while that when we have El Nino in the tropics, there are some atmospheric teleconnections that are triggered by the El Nino, which carry the El Nino signature in the North Pacific, and in particular affect the North Pacific atmosphere, in this case, the Aleutian Low, and these changes or variations in the Aleutian Low drive an oceanic response, which and the sea surface temperature assumes this particular pattern, uh, which is referred in the literature as the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, or PDO. Now, this is not to say that the Pacific Decadal Oscillation is only driven by El Nino, because there are also uh, local effects in the North Pacific that drive its variance. But there is definitely a teleconnection to the, from the El Nino. Now, when the El Nino is developing in the summer, the PDO peaks in the, in the following winter. So uh, this particular teleconnection could potentially give us a forecast potential of three to six months. Now we know that the PDO impacts krills and salmon and I want to look at one example of an impact. So we're going to look at a time series of krill in the California current in this region and if we look at this time series courtesy of Mark Homan we see very strong low frequency fluctuations that are typical of these type of uh, zooplankton indices. Now, if we compare this time series with the Pacific Decadal Oscillation Index, we find good correlation. However, we also note that the character of these two time series, or the variability of these time series, is different. The Pacific Decadal Oscillation has a lot more high-frequency fluctuations than the krill. And this is because we have to take into account the so-called Bill Peterson hypothesis, that is that the PDO changes the alongshore currents, and it's the change in the alongshore currents that advect the zooplankton in certain specific region where it's sampled. So really, the PDO forcing is mediated through the changes in the current. So if we take this into account and we develop a so-called PDO advection model, and uh, we do a forecast using that, or hindcast in this case, we find that the PDO advection model has a much uh, higher scale in capturing the low frequency changes of this uh, particular species. This idea of the PDO advection model has been tested both along the Oregon Shelf and also in the Southern California Current. And this example here is tracked from the Southern California Current. But I want to go back to the El Nino Southern Oscillation again. And in particular, I want to note that not El Nino, all El Ninos are created equal. And sometimes El Nino tend to have a peak SSD in its acute phase that is more displaced towards the Central Pacific. In fact, if we look back at the previous slide, we have here an Eastern Pacific expression and here a Central Pacific expression. So much so that this type of El Nino has referred to as the Central Pacific El Nino. And recently, uh, within Clybar, there's a new uh, working group on ANSO diversity that tries to understand these different uh, flavors of El Nino in the context of climate. And uh, some of the members of Working Group 27, in particular two members, are part of this working group and recently have contributed to a paper that describes these different uh, flavors of ANSO and their impacts. Having said that, these types of El Nino also have atmospheric teleconnections to the North Pacific, which affect the atmospheric circulation in the North Pacific, and in turn produce sea surface temperature anomalies in this particular case that look like this for the Central Pacific El Nino. And it turns out that this pattern of sea surface temperature anomalies is associated with the North Pacific gyro oscillation, or the NPGO. Now, the NPGO has been uh, reported to have impacts on climate uh, and also on ecosystem along the North Pacific coast here. Uh, 
So the question that I want to address, however, is what is the physical interpretation of the NPGO? And is how does this uh, physical interpretation help us understand the impacts that it has on marine ecosystems in the North Pacific? Now to address this question, we have to look at the mean circulation in the North Pacific. And this is a sketch of the North of the of the gyre circulation, if you like, with the Kurosho Ashu extension in this region, the North Pacific current, and then the return of the subtropical gyre and the subpolar gyre. Now during a strong NPGO, what happens is we have uh, an atmospheric forcing that generates a dipole in the sea surface height with negative anomalies and positive anomalies. And this dipole essentially uh, produces a gradient that affects right the, the axis of the North Pacific Current. And so in some sense we can say that the MPGO changes the strength of the North Pacific Current. Now it turns out that while this particular pattern of sea surface height anomaly uh, happens on year zero of the NPGO, the years following a strong NPGO, this sea surface height anomaly tends to propagate towards the western boundary until it reaches the KOE with about a time scale of three years. And these type of propagation mechanism are associated with, uh, with oceanic uh, large-scale waves, uh, also referred to as Rosby waves, and it has uh, previously been reported uh, in the literature by many authors. Now, when this uh, gradient anomaly reaches the Kuroshuashu region, it turns out that also in the KOE, uh, these anomalies change the strength of the KOE. Now, it turns out that in some previous studies, uh, Sanai Shiba had reported that changes in the currents in the KOE can affect variability in zooplankton. And this is a time series of observation of zooplankton in the Kuroshuashu extension region uh, from the so-called Odate collection. And if we compare now this zooplankton index in the KOE with changes in the strength of the KOE, or an index of the change in strength of the KOE provided by Taguchi, which is plotted here in red, we find that indeed there's a very strong correlation between the transport index, that is, the change in the strength of the KOE here, and the zooplankton. Now, I would like to focus a little bit more on this KOE index, and if our inference is correct, then uh, once we have an NPGO anomaly in the eastern and central North Pacific, we should expect three years later this anomaly to propagate in the KOE and be well correlated with this KOE transport index. And so what we can do is we can take the NPGO index and plot it against this KOE transport index, uh, but three years prior. And if we do that, indeed, we find that the NPGO index three years prior correlates uh, very well with the KOE transport index today uh, with a correlation of 0.75, which is highly uh, significant. So this implies that this particular dynamic of propagation from the west to the east gives us a forecast potential of about three years. And here I've demonstrated this dynamics using the NPGO, but a similar dynamic has been described in the literature by Bo Chu, Miller, and Schneider, and others uh, in, in the context of the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. So we've seen that at the surface we have this pathway of surface waves that carry a signature from the Northeast Pacific into the KOE with a time scale of about three years. However, the story continues because just this year Taguchi showed that in the KOE we can generate subsurface anomalies in the KOE axis here. And these subsurface anom anomalies can propagate uh, towards the eastern boundary and hit perhaps the, the central and eastern North Pacific about 10 to 20 years later. So this is a very interesting uh, uh, dynamic because these subsurface anomalies uh, can affect, for example, the properties of the water masses that end up feeding the coastal upwelling in the California current. And so, for example, one important water mass property that could be of interest for ecosystem is oxygen. And so here in this region, uh, I've plotted uh, an index of the California oxygen, uh, which is today, and you see there's very strong low-frequency multidecadal fluctuation in oxygen. So if this dynamic is robust, then one would expect that if I knew the oxygen in the North Pacific current, say 10 years prior, I could potentially predict what, what is going to be the oxygen today. So we can actually do some kind of forecast using the gyre oxygen. And so in a recent studies by Pozzo Buil, this kind of uh, idea has been uh, preliminary tested with some reanalysis data. And this is the forecast of the oxygen today using uh, the gyre oxygen index that is oxygen in this region. And what you can see is that although the correlation is not statistically significant, 
there is some general good agreement by the multi-decadal uh, component of, of the fluctuations in this time series. So much so that, uh, especially in this last phase after the year 1990, there seems to be a suggestion that there's going to be, again, another uh, decrease, another period of strong hypoxia predicted by 2020, which is an interesting date because that's also the end of the Pisces Future Science Program. Uh, and so that will give us perhaps lots of new science plans to write. So this particular dynamic of subsurface advection along the gyre could give us a forecast potential of about 10 years, uh, assuming that uh, hypoxic conditions like these are important for the ecosystem. So we've seen this uh, subsurface path and we've seen the surface path. Uh, and we can summarize this by saying that the eastern and western boundary climate connection can give us forecast potential anywhere from three years to ten years. So this is a very long time scale and it's very important. But now I want to go back also to the connection between the tropics and the North Pacific and discuss this a little bit further. So we definitely talked earlier about how when we have an El Nino in the tropics there are atmospheric teleconnections that affect uh, in the North Pacific, the North Pacific climate modes. But is there also a connection that goes from the North Pacific through ocean dynamics back to the El Nino? It turns out that there are teleconnections from the North Pacific that involve coupled dynamics between the ocean and the atmosphere that can propagate a North Pacific signal into the tropics and affect the El Nino. These dynamics go under a class of, of modes called meridional modes, uh, or also referred previously as the seasonal footprinting mechanism, and these are some of the papers that document uh, these dynamics. So the idea of this dynamic is that the trigger for this type of teleconnection is a particular uh, winter pattern of atmospheric variability, which is plotted in this picture. And this pattern is characterized by a dipole in sea level pressure and also in the winds uh, that, is, uh, that looks essentially like this. Now if we look at the time series of the winter value of this particular pattern, which in the atmospheric literature is called the North Pacific Oscillation, uh, you see that it kind of looks like this. And if we now compare these winter values of this particular index with the winter values of the El Nino 3.4 index of the following year, so essentially one year prediction, uh, this is the statistical relationship that results. And we find that indeed this the North Pacific Oscillation winter index does uh, uh, significantly uh, correlate with the Nino 3.4 index the following winter with a correlation of 0.62. So this is a statistical correlation. And so we could say that potentially one could try to forecast uh, some of the El Nino's uh, variability or the El Nino variance with uh, about a one-year uh, time scale. Although this, again, uh, remember these are forecast potentials because we really have to uh, show that this, these type of forecasts are possible and that are meaningful in terms of understanding the ecosystem response, in this case, for example, off the coast of Peru. But I want to focus on this particular winter atmospheric forcing pattern, and specifically because in 2014, that is this year, uh, this pattern was exceptionally strong and persistent. And in fact, this particular pattern had an impact already in 2014 onto the North Pacific. And the impact can be understood in the following. Once you have this dipole and sea level pressure, if we look at the ocean winds uh, and the ECMON transport or the oceanic transport that results, we find that the ocean currents that are forced by this pattern uh, approximately go in the direction of these uh, uh, magenta arrows. Now, these type of ocean transport, if we think of the mean sea surface temperature in this region, which is plotted down here, and we over superimpose these oceanic transport, what we see is this oceanic transport is acting against this very strong gradient in SST. And it's acting in bringing warmer waters from the subtropics into the, say, Gulf of Alaska. And in fact, these type of transport generated in 2014 a very strong sea surface temperature anomaly that had this kind of big pool of warm water. And it turns out that this was one of the strongest, if, if not the strongest, SST anomaly reported in the history of this region. And this is a time series in the, of sea surface temperature in the Gulf of Alaska. And you can see the variability and this very strong uh, winter 2014 sea surface temperature anomaly. Well, we can test, uh, where, you know, if indeed this particular pattern of atmospheric variability was responsible for these sea surface temperature anomalies in 2014. 
And we can do that using uh, a simple model that was published earlier by Cummins et al., for example, the 2012 paper, where we take a simple Ekman model, or in other words, a model that takes as a forcing input this type of wind variability, an index of this type of wind variability, and produces a hindcast of the sea surface temperature. And if we did that, indeed, we find that this very simple model, driven by this atmospheric winter pattern, is able to reproduce the, the sea surface temperature anomalies observed in the Gulf of Alaska with very high scale, including this very high strong anomaly in the 2014 uh, winter period. But going back to this particular uh, pattern of, of winter variability, we also said earlier that this particular uh, winter pattern of sea level pressure can indeed, through coupled ocean atmospheric dynamics, trigger uh, variability in the El Nino. And so the question is, are we going to have a strong El Nino this year? Furthermore, it turns out that this year, uh, we also had another type of uh, atmospheric forcing which is known to excite El Nino, uh, which is the tropical westerly wind burst. And these are essentially winds that take place along the zonal plane of the equator and energize uh, through the uh, excitation of Kelvin wave, a depression of the, of the thermocline, which uh, triggers essentially uh, a feedback, a so-called thermocline feedback. Uh, which favors the uh, evolution of an El Nino. It turns out that these two sets of dynamics were also very strong in the 1997 El Nino. In fact, if we look at a time series of the Nino 3 index in this particular case, in the 1997 we had a strong El Nino, and these two types of dynamics were very strong. And so this would suggest that maybe the 2014 will also be a very strong El Nino. And so with that in mind, um, a group of us uh, got together and tried to develop a very simple ENSO forecast model that would essentially use indices of these two dynamics, the North Pacific precursor dynamics and also the tropical westerly wind burst, to produce an ENSO forecast. And so we did this exercise, and this is the uh, report of this ENSO forecast model, the details of which uh, are in a paper. Um, and um, and you can see that indeed this simple forecast model does capture the 1997 El Nino and also predicts a strong 2014 El Nino. However, if we look at the sea surface temperature anomalies or the Nino 3 index right now, uh, we are nowhere close to a strong El Nino with a magnitude of 3 degrees. So the question is why did this prediction fail? And more importantly, why did this paper get rejected in nature? Well, if we think of these type of dynamics, we have to think about the fact that these dynamics of climate variability that, that we are describing in this work, in this research, are really conditioned on the mean climate state. In other words, uh, these type of dynamics may change with the changing mean climate state, and indeed there is an interaction between the mean climate state and the dynamics of climate variability. And in fact, this year, uh, there was a strong, um, you know, s well, there was a numerous set of papers that appeared in journals discussing, for example, the global warming hiatus and how some people attributed, for example, to the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. So here you have a, a climate variability process, the PVO, and a, and a hiatus of the, of the global mean temperatures, which is a change in the mean climate state that are perhaps interacting. So this definitely recurs, represents a challenge for us in terms of uh, you know, developing uh, models that can exploit predictability based on the dynamics of climate variability. Nevertheless, uh, uh, I think that we put forward some advances in forecasting climate and ecosystem, specifically in the exploiting the eastern and western boundary climate teleconnection, as well as the tropics to North Pacific climate connection. And we showed how these types of climate connection could potentially provide us forecast skill ranging from 1 to 10 years. However, again, uh, before concluding, we have to remember that these types of uh, dynamics of climate variability are conditioned in the mean climate state. And so the future research probably of the working group and also within Pisces and the larger community will focus and is focusing on trying to understand what these interactions are so that we can better understand the dynamics of climate variability. Now some of the dynamics, uh, surface dynamics of the eastern western boundary climate connection, the tropics, north pacific climate connections are also uh, uh, reported in a synthesis paper that was uh, contributed by myself and other uh, members of the working group 27. It's called the Synthesis of Pacific Ocean Climate and Ecosystem Variability and this is available in progress uh, of oceanography. And so I will conclude with this and um, if there's any questions I'd be happy to answer. Thank you very much.